Minister and uh, for all the, the witnesses. Um, just, just to one point about the HSE board, because obviously it got some publicity today. So there were two, two voices demurring from that, but there are 12 members of the HSE board. So I think the bottom line is the HSE board has approved of this, uh, regardless of, uh, of why and how many. We haven't heard the view that we have of, of Fergus Findlay as to why he supported it, but we didn't get the views of the other eight or nine as to why they supported it. We've got the views of the two who demurred, and I respect them and uh, thank them for making their submission to the committee. But for those people who are watching, I think it is important to state that the board of the HSE supports the move. Just again for people who are watching, um, uh, giving some very brief background uh, on my uh, myself, um, there was a, an ad hoc cross-party group uh, established last year with some members from parties, including myself from my own party and one or two colleagues, uh, set up, I suppose, based on those people who had concerns about the move uh, to the uh, St. Vincent Hospital site. So I was a member of that. So that's where I was coming from. I had concerns. Um, and I think the, uh, the time and energy and detailed interrogation uh, of uh, all the issues involved in it between last year and this year has been incredibly valuable. Um, the second point I want to make as well uh, is I supported the Eighth Amendment and strongly supported uh, women, uh, their own right to choose, and investing trust in women to make the best decisions uh, in relation to their own health and their own bodies. So I think that's important to state. Um, I think, Minister, you'll agree that if we were starting today, everybody would want uh, this hospital built on public land uh, with public money. But this process didn't begin today. It began in 2013. You inherited it as Minister for Health two years ago. Could you give us a brief, maybe two, three minute summary of what you inherited and where you have taken it to? Thanks, Deputy. And with your permission, before I do, just given that you were referencing the, the board, would it be okay to hear from the chair of the board to, to, to address the, the, points you, it, yeah. the points you made? So I might just run you through the history, yeah. and if, if, with your permission, we might just hear from Kieran Devan, if that's okay. okay. So, so my understanding is people have been talking about this for decades, um, that there were doctors being hired into Hollis Street in the 60s who were being asked when they were going to move to co-locate with the adult hospital. Um, but the process, as we understand it now, um, began in 2013 when uh, Minister Riley announced uh, the intention to move. This was on the back of a KPMG report which he, which he uh, had received. Um, so in July of that year, the uh, Campus Project Board was established uh, by the HSC. And then in 2015, there was a memo to government on uh, the relocation of the Coombe and the Rotunda, actually, which uh, we should talk about uh, on another day, but which noted the recommendation that um, Hollis Street should move to Elm Park, essentially. Um, and then in 2016, uh, the Mulvey Agreement was brought together. My understanding is the negotiations were uh, complex and the negotiations at times were difficult. And so Mr Mulvey was brought in to chair that. And the, the Mulvey Agreement was, was put together. And that essentially, the corporate structures and, and what we're seeing today uh, it came out of the Mulvey Agreement, and Dr Mahoney was involved in that, and, and, and she may want to add to that. So then in 2017, uh, there was a memo from Minister Harris for information to government on the relocation. Um, planning permission was secured in 2017. Uh, and then in 2018, um, there was another uh, memo to government uh, on the relocation and agreement in principle on some of the, some of the key areas. Um, and then in 2018, also the contract for the first phase um, was announced. So as you'll be aware, significant works have already happened in terms of pharmacies and car parks and so forth. <clears throat> and so um, what changes have been made since then? Uh, essentially, we've moved from a 99-year lease to a 299-year lease, or from 100 years to 300 years. Uh, we've moved from one public interest director to three. So it was 144. It's now 333. Uh, and critically, we've written the constitution. And all parties have been involved in that. And the Constitution is essential to all of this, because the Constitution is the operating manual and the legal instructions for how the NMH will work. Um, and, and 
what we've done with it is really important, right? Not only through the Constitution uh, are we guaranteeing independence, which everyone rightly has demanded, clinical, uh, operational independence. We've gone a step much further, uh, which I'm advised by the Attorney General is either very rare or unique. We're not just saying that the new hospital can provide all services. We are saying that they must provide all services. Um, six times in the Constitution, we have said that there can never be any religious influence whatsoever. The, the, the board of directors are uh, obliged under their own constitution to, to ensure that all services are provided. And then as a final uh, certainty, the Minister for Health has the power to intervene at their discretion to ensure that A, that all services are provided, and B, that they're provided without any religious uh, influence so, so, uh, at all. So the, the three big changes okay. are boards of directors, um, the lease, and then the constitution. And then with permission, yep. Kieran Devan might come in on, Kieran, uh, might on the take board. <coughs> a minute and a half, please, yeah. I don't mean to um, shoehorn you into it. But. Thank you. Um, we, we had a number of you know, very good, very detailed, very robust debates over the last 12 months, um, trying to address all the issues which people are legitimately concerned about, and wanting to see that there, there is a, a solution to. So, for example, we, were, you know, we wanted to see the transfer of shares come through. Uh, we wanted to see some of the, um, the details on the, lend, the length of the, the lease consistently written in all the documents across um, the whole uh, agreement. And the Constitution, for me, also, um, it was one of the, the things I was um, pushing very hard is the foundation document around the protections for women and the independence of the uh, clinical decision making and making sure that this will be you know, the biggest and most exciting step forward new hospital that we are building um, in the HSE for the foreseeable future. Because it's not just about um, moving location, it's an increase in capacity. Um, you know, 100 beds going up to 150, so there'll be more capacity and better capacity. It's to allow the, the innovations to take place, um, things we don't really talk about like gynae mesh, menopausal clinics uh, and so on, there'll be those services put in uh, as well. So as a board, we saw all these amazing things that we were doing. We had very robust debates. Um, the conclusion we came to as a board was that there are sufficient protections in for the things that people are worried about and there's a tremendous opportunity to make um, a major step forward, uh, and that was the decision of the board. Thank you. Look, it's, uh, <clears throat> so Wednesday this week, it's very easy to, uh, I mean, this boils down to me, a couple of issues, really, of ethos and governance. That's what the, the okay, uh, ethos, governance, man, ownership. And it's like the ethos piece uh, has been forgotten um, because it seems to have been dealt with successfully. Ethos was a big issue two weeks ago for protagonists and oppositions and opponents. Um, and it seems to me that you have satisfied uh, all the concerns and queries around that. Um, Dr. Peter Boylan, he's going to be a witness tomorrow, so I have no issue making this point while he's not here. He'll have a chance to operate uh, to, to answer tomorrow. I mean, one of his major points was that no Catholic, it's repeated today in the paper, no Catholic e ethos hospital in the world including St. Vincent's public and private hospitals, permits, and he includes, termination among that. Do terminations take place at the moment <clears throat> in St. Vincent's Hospital? Yes. There is no impediment in the structures of St. Vincent's um, that that's, allows... That's the existing St. Vincent's There is hospital. no yet vehicle or structure within any of the constitutions in Vincent's that allows any influence by religious or Catholic ethos, we perform all procedures according to what patients need. That's, um, in, and there, that's it, in the existing St. Vincent's. In the existing St. Vincent's. So either it's not, uh, either it's the first hospital under mm. Catholic management in the history of the church that allows terminations, or it is not a hospital uh, through which a Catholic ethos permeates. Yeah. It's one or the other. To, just to take that point, um, often, when Catholic institutions divest um, their assets, um, it goes into another institution that's called a public juridic body, mm. and ethos is maintained. Specifically in this case, and I don't know if we are the first, that's not the point, but specifically in this case, St. Vincent's Hospital is not, absolutely not, a public juridic body. Okay, so 
my time is over, but I just want to make this point, particularly to people who are watching and who've had most of the emails, Chair, that I've had in relation to this in the last month, in the last two months, are the fear of women, justifiable and legitimate fear of women, that there will be church interference or the interference of a religious ethos in terms of any procedures that they are entitled to under law. And we seem to have forgotten that really quickly, and I think we've forgotten it because it's been dealt with. So all those fears and concerns that were raised, I think, have been very, very adequately dealt with, to the point that they're not being raised anymore. Now it's all about governance and ownership. But let's not forget the most significant points that were raised in relation to the National Maternity Hospital is that all procedures and interventions necessary for women's health, that they would be somehow jeopardised under this structure. It's too convenient now to focus on, oh, actually, it's all about ownership and it's all about governance. Up to a week ago, two weeks ago, it was about ethos, religious interference, being, you know, that no Catholic uh, run hospital in the world could provide X and Y. Terminations take place in St. Vincent's Hospital right now. And the public need to be aware of that and women need to be aware of that and not for the com conversation to be contaminated. Uh, by um, supposition, catastrophizing, conspiracy building, and all the rest of it. There are my questions. Thank Thanks you very much. Rosine, you're next. Thank you. Thank you. Higgins, just re respond very shortly to Deputy I Lard. just want to reiterate my point. I, now that you say that, I didn't realize what history making we were doing, but we have provided care. I've been one of the people doing it. Thank you. I can't give great um, detail. Because the point of repeal is that we wouldn't be talking about this, that this would be private. Okay. So I'm not going to give the specific clinical details, but the people who were looked, over in, looked after in Vincent's, or I was a member of a large multidisciplinary team that we acquired a lot of time to plan how to do this safely, how to do it kindly, how to do it well. It was clinically necessary. And if I ever could tell you the details, which I cannot tell and you. And I respect that. So that comes under clinical appropriateness. Absolutely. Thank you. And we can talk more about that as well, if you wish. Okay.